Welcome to Spring Creek Church Online. Whether this is your first time or you've been with us before, we are so excited that you are with us today. If this is your first time, we'd like to get to know who you are. So if you would text NEW to 96995, one of our pastors will be in contact with you. And to find out all the things that are happening with us, you can also check us out on social media. You can like us on Facebook, you can follow us on Instagram, or you can subscribe on our YouTube channel. Thank you for being with us today. Thanks for joining us this week here at Spring Creek Church Online. This is going to be an exciting new series that we're calling Christmas in a Minor Key. Uh, I'll be talking to you a lot about that series, about this series as I open the message today. But before I get into the message, let me just take a moment and say, you know, this past year has been really challenging for a lot of folks, both in our church and in our community. And as you're well aware, we have a steady stream of people literally every single week who come to the church seeking assistance. Uh, it, it ranges from anything for diapers and formula for their babies to needing rent money to needing help with a medical expense, all types of things. And we help as much as we possibly can. I do want you to know because those needs have been so great this year and we really don't see any abatement of that happening anytime soon, I would really love to challenge you, especially at this end of the year, that you would consider making a special gift to our Benevolence Fund. Uh, this is money that we do and we use to serve our community in the church and outside the church, and it is always money put to good use. So during this time of, of celebration, during this time of giving, during this time of remembrance of the great sacrifice of Christ, it would be wonderful if you and your family would consider a special gift above and beyond what you normally give to Spring Creek Church just to make a difference in the needs of so many during a time of a great challenge in our country and in our community. So thanks for considering that. Before we get started in today's message, I'm calling today's message, Herod, the man who tried to kill Christmas. Before we get started, let's just pray together. Father, I just want to thank you that uh, you've given us this this day, this Sunday, to really uh, set aside time for you, that God, we're gathered around your word, we're focused on you, we want to hear from you today. I pray that, God, you would use this message uh, in the way it was intended. You, you've prepared my heart. I've tried to prepare it before you to share the things, God, you've laid on my heart, and so, God, may they find a receptive home. In your name I pray, amen. So some of you might be wondering about the title of my new Christmas message series, Christmas in a Minor Key. So let me explain. There's a tendency when we read the Bible to gravitate to the big names, you know, Abraham and Moses and David and Peter and Paul. And in the Christmas story, we really do the same thing. It's all about Mary and the baby Jesus. But that's just not the way the Christmas story is told in the Bible. Throughout the Christmas story, there are all sorts of minor characters who play major roles in how the story unfolds. But because we spend so much time centered and focused on the main characters, we tend to treat the minor characters as insignificant or unimportant. That's a mistake. Because God chose to include them in the Christmas story for a reason. In some way, they help to communicate and illuminate the message of Christmas. In addition, in music, Playing in a minor key often evokes feelings of sadness, depression, fear, misery, loss, or even stress. That also happens to be why many of these minor characters, including the Christmas story, are there. They're include, they're, they're, they introduce to us an element of sadness, fear, and loss to the Christmas story. You know, as much as we want to turn this time of the year into a magical holiday that's all starry and bright, there really is a darkness, a, a sadness, a scandalous nature to the original Christmas story that's impossible to ignore. It's the world into which Christ was born, and it's the world as we know it today. I mean, if you lose the gritty reality of the first Christmas story, you rob it of its power to heal a broken world. We can't ignore these minor characters because they're the reason Christ came in the first place. You know, years ago, I did a series of messages that I called Lessons in Good Living from the Bible's Bad Guys. And in that sort, series, we looked at some of the Bible's most despicable, most rotten, and most misunderstood characters and what we can learn from their lives. People like Judas, Rahab, Jezebel, and Absalom. 
it went over in such a big way that a year later, I did another series that I called More Lessons in Good Living from the Bible's Bad Guys, where I told the story of Tamar, Lot, Balaam, and the Witch of Endor. I mean, let's face it, God put these stories in the Bible for a reason. And even though they're often neglected by the average Bible student, they're included to teach us things we don't know about ourselves, about God, and this world. This message is very similar to that series because the guy we're looking at today is not just a minor character in the Christmas drama, but also happens to be the quintessential villain. He's Darth Vader, the Grinch, and Lord Voldemort all rolled up into one. Herod is the original Scrooge in the Christmas story, but he's a Scrooge whose heart never grows, a Scrooge whose heart remains tiny and as cold as ice. He's the man who tried to kill Christmas. But Herod plays an important role in the saga, and, and if you really want to understand what Christmas is about, you need to understand why Herod is included in this story. So here's the deal. Whenever we study the Gospels, there's four questions we need to ask. The first question is this, what is the historical setting? In other words, what else do we need to know and understand about this story in terms of its culture, its time, its politics, to put it in its proper context and to really get what it's saying to us? And second, why did the gospel writers choose to include this story? I mean, they had literally thousands of other stories to choose from. Why this one? What makes this story and this character so important? Then the last two questions, what does this story teach us about ourselves? And what does, this teach, what does this story teach us about God? And that's actually my outline today. So first, what is the historical setting? I want you to listen to a historian. His name is Paul Mayer. He wrote, you may be surprised to hear this, but believe it or not, if, you are ever, if you're ever asked which is the one figure from the ancient world on whom we have the most primary evidence from original sources than anyone else in the world, the answer is not Jesus or St. Paul, or Caesar Augustus, or Julius Caesar. None of these. Alexander the Great? No, no. It is Herod the Great, believe it or not. Why? Because Josephus gives us two whole book scrolls on the life of Herod the Great, and that is more primary material than anyone else. So really, we actually know a lot about Herod apart from the Bible. Approximately 60 years before Jesus was born, the Roman general Pompey captured Jerusalem and the rest of Palestine. The Romans installed local rulers and eventually installed Herod as the ruler of the Jews. But what you need to understand for purposes of this story is Herod was only half Jewish. His mom was Jewish for sure, but his dad was Idumean. So in 40 BC, the Roman Senate named Herod the king of the Jews. It was a title the Jewish people hated because Herod was not a Jew by birth since he was a mixed race child, and he was not a Jew by religious practice either. By the way, Herod the Great, that's a name he bestowed upon himself. So no ego here, right? If you want to know Herod from history, where he made a name for himself and what really endeared him to the Romans were the massive building projects he undertook on behalf of the empire. So let's briefly talk about Herod's building projects. Just like most people with massive egos, inside they feel really small. They're always competing against feelings of massive insecurity. So many of the building projects that were attempted by Herod were really just attempts to prove he was a big man. He constructed a beautiful port at the Mediter Mediterranean Sea called Caesarea Maritima. It's in honor of Caesar himself, the emperor. So if you were to travel to that part of the world today, you can still see the ruins of this once amazing place. So on your screens right now, those are the ruins of Caesarea Maritima, but this second rendering is a before after pick. It's an architectural rendering of what it might have looked like in Herod's day. So really it's quite an engineering marvel, but that's not all. At the southwestern edge of the Dead Sea, there's a mountaintop fortress called Masada. You probably heard that name. This too is a part of Herod's legacy. The rocky cliffs rise about 1,300 feet above the surrounding desert floor, and on top of the cliffs lie the remains of a military encampment. Though it was originally built for the Romans, Masada holds a very special place in the memory of the Jewish people. It was a place of last resistance for the Jews, and to this day, new Jewish soldiers are always taken there for their swearing-in ceremony. Herod also built a personal palace near Bethlehem. 
Bethlehem, you might be remember, is often referred to as the city of David because it was where King David was born. We also know from Old Testament prophecies that the Messiah was to come out of Bethlehem. So Herod intentionally builds his palace on top of a man-made mountain overlooking Bethlehem. It's called the Herodium. So it's named after Herod himself. Inside this palace in the middle of the desert was a swimming pool the size of three modern Olympic swimming pools. There was an amphitheater where Herod and 900 of his closest friends could be entertained. There are tunnels inside the mountain that lead up to this palace built 350 feet in the air. This palace was taller than the great pyramids in Egypt, and that was important to Herod, to have a palace higher than the pyramids. All of this was really Herod's way of saying to the entire world, I'm a big deal. I'm the king of this mountain. I tower over the city of David. Look at me. I'm the new king of the Jews. But Herod's crowning achievement was actually the reconstruction of the Jewish temple. Now, you might remember that the temple in Jerusalem was constructed three different times. The original one was built by Solomon. It was magnificent. Solomon's temple was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. A second temple was rebuilt by a man named Zerubbabel. The second temple wasn't nearly as nice as the first. In fact, many people saw it as a disappointment. But Herod wanted to change all that. So around 20 years before Christ, Herod began to rebuild the temple, a project that lasted over 80 years and involved over 10,000 workers. He was determined to make it even more magnificent than Solomon's original temple had been. It really ranked among the wonders of the ancient world. Herod's temple became legend. So much so that there was even a proverb in those days that said, he who has not seen Herod's building has never seen anything beautiful. Today, the Western Wall, or what's commonly referred to as the Wailing Wall, is all that survives of Herod's temple. But there's something else you should know. Even though Herod tried to follow biblical criteria in constructing the temple, like not including images, uh, allowing only the priests to work on the temple proper, and never entering the inner rooms himself, Late in the construction, Herod enraged the Jews by placing the image of a Roman eagle on the entrance of the temple gates. So get this, later in his life, Herod fell sick. And when that happened, some young men went to the temple with axes to chop down that Roman eagle from the temple entrance. To the Jews, the eagle was blasphemous. Not only was it a graven image, but it also represented Rome and was an attempt to merge the power of the state with religion to make them appear united as one. This was unthinkable to the Jewish people. But sadly, these young men were caught by some Roman soldiers who took them to Herod. Herod was so angered by what they had done that he had them burned alive. Now you gotta remember, Herod didn't build the temple because he was religious. He built the temple because he believed it would placate the Jews and protect his own throne. Herod was a puppet king of Rome. What Rome wanted, Herod did. Herod's religion was politics and nothing else. He was a sad man. But one more thing. Herod built his reputation and kingdom on the backs of others. See, the truth is you simply don't understand the life and times of the New Testament if you don't understand the crushing poverty that most people were enduring. You've probably heard the term subsistence before. It means to be barely making it. It means you have just enough resources to get just enough calories to keep your body alive and functioning. It means living one accident or one injury away from starvation. First century poverty, poverty in Jesus' day, was some of the worst the world has ever known. It's been estimated that 22% of the population were stable, but near subsistence subsistence level. In other words, they were just making it relatively stable, but one bad turn of events like a sickness, a death, an accident, or injury could easily take them under. 40% of the population were at subsistence level. So if you live at the poverty line, it doesn't take something major to take you under. Just one small unexpected expense puts you behind and you have no ability to recover from that setback. 28% of the population were chronically below subsistence levels. Now, if you're below subsistence level, it means you're going without necessities. It means there are days sometimes you don't eat. Uh, Things that need medical attention, they're ignored or just tolerated, put up with. You often have to beg to get what you need for the day. 
So in practical terms, 28% were starving, with another 40% nearly starving, and an additional 22% who were just one bad turn or one unexpected expense from putting them into the starving category. So what that means is 87%, the vast majority of the people, were at or below the poverty line. That's staggering. We really don't find those kind of numbers in the world today, except in failed states like Venezuela, Syria, and the Congo. Here's something else. In the first century, there was no middle class. There were the very wealthy and there were the very poor and practically no one in the gap between. It's been said the general trend in the empire was the ever increasing concentration of land in the hands of its governing aristocracy at the expense of the population at large. So you get what he's saying. The top 3% of the population in that day were the wealthy, and they gobbled up all the land, both as investments and as a reward to faithful Roman citizens. As a result, rent and taxes just continued to climb into the stratosphere. When the people could no longer pay, they were simply evicted from the land. In addition, tax collectors were extorting the poor and collecting even more than what was required. Even John the Baptist called out this behavior. By the way, it's no accident that during the Jewish revolt that happened between 66 and 70 AD, when the common people finally got the upper hand in Jerusalem, one of the first things they did was the burning of the debt records and killed many of the wealthy citizens of Jerusalem. So Herod had his massive building projects for sure, and the people paid dearly for all of them. And that leads us to this, Herod the not so great. First thing I tell you about Herod is he had a Messiah complex. Herod saw himself as the long-awaited Messiah, the king of the Jews. He wanted to be the greatest king since David, even greater. This was his mindset, and that's the way he ruled. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, the Jewish people didn't even see Herod as one of them. How could he be the Messiah? He wasn't even a full-blooded Jew. So King Herod wasn't anointed by the high priest as the Messiah, and instead he was anointed by Rome. He was Caesar's king, but not their king. In addition, Herod was paranoid. In fact, Herod's paranoia was so extreme, so well known, that he had a long list of people executed for treason, like his wife Miriam. She happened to be one of the, his favorite of his 10 wives. Three of his sons, Alexander, Antipater, Antipater and Aristobulus, his brother-in-law, Costobar, his mother-in-law, Alexandra. In addition, he drowned a high priest, killed several uncles, and a couple of his cousins. Now, in light of all these executions, the Roman emperor, Augustus, once joked about Herod, it's better to be Herod's pig than his son. Josephus, who's the Jewish historian who wrote so much about the life of Herod, he said, Herod is a murderous old man. The ultimate example of his violent paranoia is seen in, in what he did right before he died. When Herod was 70 years old, he was terminally ill and he knew it. He moved from Jerusalem down to the garden city of Jericho. In one of his final executive acts as king, he ordered his troop to arrest a group of Jerusalem's most distinguished citizens on false charges and put him in prison. Do you know why he did that? Because Herod left orders for all of them to be executed upon word of his death. You see, Herod knew that no one in Israel would mourn his passing, but he wanted there to be te tears of grief when he died. So he explained, the people will not weep when I die and I want them weeping, even if they weep over someone else. How sick is that? Now, thank God that particular order was not carried out, but that's who Herod was. That's who he was in history. Now, let's look at how we see him to be in history and how that plays into the Christmas story by asking the question, why did the gospel writers choose to include this story? You see, one of the major reasons we're told this story is because Herod is the butcher of Bethlehem. Here's how the Bible describes it. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who's been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it arose, and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all of Jerusalem with him. Many of you know the story of the Magi, the, the three wise men, or, or we say three wise men. We don't know how many wise men there were. We know there were three gifts. They came from the east. They came seeking the Messiah. 
Herod gets to meet and interact with the wise men before they actually find the Christ child. But what's most telling in this whole episode is Herod's reaction when he discovers the Messiah has been born. The word the Bible uses here is disturbed. And in the original language, it literally means to shake violently. This puts real fear into Herod's heart. He's been blindsided by this question of the Magi. For one, Herod himself is called the king of the Jews. In his mind, I'm sure his first question is, who is this wannabe king? So the question triggers Herod's paranoia. The idea of a baby born king of the Jews is a direct threat to his throne. And what makes this prospect even more frightening is this. How do these outsiders know about this? And he doesn't. By their own admission, they've been following some supernatural sign in the sky for some time that indicated the Messiah's arrival. What sign is that? How come no one else is talking about it? So Herod is caught completely off guard. He doesn't know the answer to their question as to where this newborn king was supposed to be born, but he knows who will. So he rounds up the religious leaders of Jerusalem, and here's what the Bible says happened next. When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. Now, have you ever watched those crime shows on television, like about cold cases, about unsolved murders? In one of these shows I was watching, a detective was being interviewed and he made this observation. He said, if someone's asking a lot of questions about the details of a murder investigation, they quickly become a prime suspect. Why? Because people who are guilty are paranoid. They're paranoid about getting caught. So their over curiosity is a dead giveaway that something else is really going on. In the same way, Herod's asking a whole lot of questions, but it's not out of curiosity. Something else is going on. Herod is worried about his throne and he wants to eliminate this rival. So Herod turns to the scribes and the priests for advice. He he has only one question. Where is this child to be born? Did you notice that the scribes don't even have to look it up? They know the answer. This is common knowledge in Israel. Kids learn it in Sabbath school before they were six years old. It's hard to believe that Herod didn't know it. 700 years earlier, the prophet Micah had predicted the Messiah's birth in Bethlehem. So Herod does something really strange here. He calls in the Magi and he asks them when the star first appeared. The question about the star is an attempt to determine the child's age because Herod assumes that the rising of the star coincided with the child's birth. Of course, Herod is only feigning curiosity. It's really just a ruse to figure out the age of the child in order to narrow his search. Ultimately, what this leads to is an edict by Herod to slaughter all the boys under the age of two in the city of Bethlehem just to be sure he killed the right kid. So after asking the wise men this question, he sends them off with his blessing. The Bible says he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Now remember these magi, these wise men from a distant land, they, they don't know Herod at all. They don't know his character. They don't know what kind of man he is. Herod here is pretending to share their devotion but it's just a big lie. Of course, they don't return to Herod to give him the location of the child because God warns them in a dream not to go back. In addition, by the time Herod figures out that they're not coming back and he enacts his plan to kill all the male toddlers in Bethlehem, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus have already fled for Egypt. The story brings up an important point about tyrants though. All tyrants are cowards at heart. Those with the toughest talk are always the biggest chickens. It's always been that way. They rule by force, but the one thing they fear most is a force greater than theirs. If Messiah had come, that means Herod's power was about to be eclipsed. The other reason this story is included in the Christmas story has a lot to do with the Old Testament parallels. You see, Herod's wicked act fulfilled the prophecy of Jeremiah, which had said, a voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. 
You know, he ordered this cold-blooded murder of the male babies under the age of two. And I, I just want you to try to imagine that scene all through the night, the soldiers going from house to house, finding and killing every male child aged two and under. Throughout the night, you would hear the cries of moms and dads who've just had their children ripped from their arms and killed before their very eyes. But what exactly does this verse mean? It says, a voice was heard in Rama of weeping and great mourning. So get this. Herod's act is so horrible that Rachel's weeping can be heard in Rama. Rama is six miles north of Jerusalem. Bethlehem is six miles south of Jerusalem. So Matthew's describing a heart cry so loud it could be heard 12 miles away. It's an exaggeration for sure but a powerful picture of the loss and the devastation and the grief that this community has been plunged into. What you need to understand is Rachel was buried in Bethlehem. And Matthew is quoting from Jeremiah 31, 15. The context of Jeremiah 31 is the deportation of the Jews to Babylon, the time of captivity. In Jeremiah 31, Rachel is seen as weeping from beyond the grave because she's already dead at this time. But she weeps from beyond the grave for her descendants who are being carried off into judgment. Rachel's weeping is a figure of speech. Kind of like when, when we say, you know, if someone knew such and such, they'd roll over in their graves. In the same way, the loss to the people of God is so great that Rachel is weeping again like she did 500 years before. By the way, if you've ever been to Bethlehem, there is a church called the Church of the Nativity. I've been to this church. It's built over the cave, which is said to be the place where Jesus was born. If you go down below the cave of the Nativity, you'll find a passageway that most Christians never get to see. Even if you visit the Holy Land, you're not guaranteed to visit this place. So I thought that I'd show you a photo of it. Beneath the cave of the Nativity, the bones of dozens of children are kept and are said to be the bones of the innocents who were slaughtered by King Herod. Now, whether or not these are truly the remains of those children killed in Bethlehem, you get the idea of just how horrifying this was for the people of Bethlehem and how they remembered this story for all time. But there's another reason this story is included in Matthew's gospel. Remember, Matthew is writing primarily to a Jewish audience, and this story has amazing parallels with another story in the Old Testament. You know what I'm talking about? 1,300 years before Jesus was born, Moses was born. Do you remember the circumstances surrounding Moses' birth? He was born in Egypt when the Israelites were slaves. Pharaoh was the king, and he decided there were too many Jews. So he instructed all the midwives to take all the newborn baby boys from their Jewish mothers and drown them in the Nile River. So surrounding the birth of both of these great leaders, male infants were being slaughtered. In the same way, Moses was saved by his courageous parents from certain death at the hands of Pharaoh, Jesus was also saved by his parents in a courageous act as they fled Bethlehem to go live in Egypt until Herod died. Moses was in Egypt, Jesus ends up in Egypt. Both of them come out of Egypt and they end up in the promised land. These are just a few of the many parallels in the Gospel of Matthew between Moses and Jesus. What Matthew's trying to say is that there's one greater than Moses here. Moses was the great lawgiver, but Jesus would be the first person in human history to actually fulfill the law. Jesus is greater than Moses. This is one of the themes of Matthew's Gospel. So all of that leads to this final question. What does this story teach us about ourselves and God? Well, the first principle is simply this, that Herod is a symbol for the kind of world into which Jesus came. Matthew wants us to know that the shadow of rejection never lifts from Christ. It began before he was even born, when his mother was in danger of being rejected by Joseph. At his birth, Herod is on this all-out seek-and-destroy mission to eradicate the newborn king before he ever comes of age. Matthew records how Jesus' forerunner, John the Baptist, is put into prison and beheaded. The Pharisees, the religious, the religious establishment, they oppose Jesus at every turn. By Matthew's gospel in chapter, chapter 13, halfway through the book, even the crowds have begun to reject the message of Jesus. So Herod represents the world's welcoming committee for the Son of God. Jesus, the Son of God, comes into this world on a rescue mission to save lost humanity. And the first thing humans did the first thing the powers that be attempted was to kill him. 
This is what the Bible means when it says, he came to what was his own, but his own did not receive him. No other gospel does as much as Matthew does to show the rejection and the opposition to Christ. That's what these final words of John, what, uh, that, that John records speaks volumes. Pilate said to the Jews, behold your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. Then he handed, them over to be, handed him over to be crucified. Imagine what it would take for a Jewish person to say that they had no king but Caesar. And then you'll understand something of the hatred and the rejection that Christ uh, received from the Jewish people. Friends, Christmas is not just about chestnuts roasting on an open fire or Christmas carols or even exchanging presents. Christmas is about Almighty God declaring war on evil and reminding us all that we have to choose a side. What I'm saying is the real message of Christmas is threatening. God has invaded our turf, and Jesus demands the position we want for ourselves. So the question that Matthew's gospel puts before us is, who is the king of your life? You know what bothers me about this time of the year is that many people think that by doing religious things, spiritual things during Christmas, they're honoring God and making him happy. Folks, God could care less if you ever sang another Christmas carol for the rest of your life. He wouldn't care if you never went to a Christmas Eve service because all those things mean nothing to him unless they're accompanied by a desire to treat him as king for the rest of the year. Who is the king of your life? Who really gets your ultimate allegiance? There's another reason this story is included in the Christmas story, and that is that Herod and his character are meant to be a mirror for us. Herod's life is a dramatic caricature of what life looks like when our insecurities and fears get the best of us. And if we're honest, there's a shadow of Herod in all of us, in me. We all struggle with insecurities. We all struggle with our fears and our failures. We struggle with the feeling of not being enough. And if we allow ourselves to keep going down that path, then just like Herod, we begin to see others as a threat. The Bible concludes the story by noting the death of Herod. Josephus tells us that when he died, maggots had eaten away part of his body. He died in agony, insane, tormented, and delirious. So the question is, what's, what's been Herod's legacy? You know, today there's no hospitals built in Herod's name. No colleges or university claim Herod as their inspiration. No charities rally people around a good cause by remembering Herod's influence. Herod's picture doesn't adorn anyone's building, home, or jewelry. On the other hand, there's Jesus. In the beginning, Jesus was born into a homeless set of circumstances, while Herod enjoyed his choice of palace beds. But in the end, Herod lay dead, and Jesus lived. Even after his death, Jesus lived again, and today, the world is changed and into a better place, not because of Herod the Great, but because Jesus is great. 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years later now, you cannot count the hospitals that have started because of what Jesus said and did. Many of the greatest schools and universities in the world were birthed because of devotion to Jesus Christ. Billions still re revere his name, rem memorize his saying, trust him with their lives and with their deaths. We have paintings of Jesus in our homes, in our offices, in our churches, and symbols of his influence in our jewelry. While Herod had enormous wealth, Jesus never had a penny. Herod had palaces, but Jesus had no place to lay his head. To the unsuspecting eye, Herod was the one in control. He had all the power. He was destined to leave a great legacy. But now that 2,000 years have passed, we know the truth. Even Herod's greatest architectural achievements lie in ruins. But what Jesus has built in the hearts and lives of his people, it lives forever. And that leads us to this. God wants to show us what true greatness looks like. Let me ask you something. Once the Magi finally found the toddler Jesus, do you think they were disappointed? I mean, Jesus didn't look like a king. His home was no castle. He had no scepter in his hand. He could barely walk or talk. There was nothing about him or especially his circumstances to make you think this child, this baby was a king. To the outward eye, he was nothing but a peasant child born in desperate poverty. But to the Magi, he was a king. He possessed more royalty in his cradle than Herod possessed in his palace. 
He was greater in his infancy than Herod was in his ascendancy. Somehow the Magi were able to see beyond the present circumstances and trusted that what God had promised in his word was true. They saw that this child would one day rule the world and they were not ashamed to fall on their faces before him and worship him. Matthew's gospel is literally filled with references to Christ's royalty. There are many direct references. Here's just a few of them. First, the question of the Magi. Where is he who's been born king of the Jews? Matthew puts this story first for a reason. It sets up the question for the entire gospel, who is the king of the Jews? That's who Herod claimed to be. He was not. But when the Magi asked who was the one born king of the Jews, Herod knew they were not talking about him. Before Pilate, Jesus was asked a question. Look at this exchange. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor questioned him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, It is as you say. At the cross, we find even another example. And above his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Besides the references to Christ as king in Matthew's gospel, there's even more references to Christ's kingdom in Matthew's gospel. Jesus is the king who's come to set up his kingdom. So let's pause a minute and ask ourselves this. What can we learn from this? Herod's life is a warning that seeking greatness, significance is not necessarily bad, but everything rides on how we define that greatness. You see, it was Jesus himself. He never said, don't seek greatness. Instead, he redefined greatness. He said, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. All of us can easily become obsessed with building our own little kingdoms, our, our own plans, our own homes, our own businesses, our own recognition, and miss the path to true greatness. The upward path to greatness leads to anxiety and worry and envy and jealousy, and in the end, nothing that lasts. Yet, into a world that celebrates moving upwards, Jesus celebrates the ability to descend. I'm sorry to say, Herod still exists today. There's still people who won't allow anything, even God, to interfere with their career, their positions, their power, their ambition, their plans, and their lifestyle. They're not about to let someone else be king of their lives. They see Jesus as a threat, just like Herod did. Herod's obsession was up and was fear, filled with the fear of moving down. He was obsessed with winning and couldn't stand the thought of losing. Lose was the only four-letter word in Herod's vocabulary. You really couldn't put two people more opposite together than Jesus and Herod. They were destined to clash from the very start because Herod couldn't see or understand God's view of greatness. Both kings possessed immense power, but how they used that power revealed their heart. One was motivated by self-interest, the other by love. One was manipulating, deceiving, and terrorizing. The other was all about healing, teaching, and delivering. One was a tyrant, the other was a servant. One wanted to be God, the other was God. Jesus used his power and resources not to promote himself, but to promote us. Jesus willingly went down, down, all the way to the grave to lift, lift us up. You know, this is a time of the year that I think we often kind of lose sight of what's really important. And I think the thing that probably bothers the, me the most is when I see the Christmas story sanitized, that, that, that we, we, we make it so pure, so innocent, so, so full of nostalgia and wonderful memories that, that we literally lose the gritty reality of what this story is about. Jesus was born into a very difficult circumstance and a very difficult world opposed from the beginning, attempted murder from the very beginning. I mean, this is a challenging story, but it tells us why he came. You know, we often say Jesus is the reason for the season, and I agree. I mean, he's the reason, his birth, that's why we celebrate. But you know, the reason for the season are the Herods of the world. 
It's because we live in such a messed up, broken world. And you see, it's only this story when we tell it right, when we tell it the way the gospels tell it, that it's actually good news. Because Jesus invades a broken world like yours and mine, a world that's full of unjust men, evil causes, where people who are taking advantage of others, they seem to always be on top, where it seems like there's always someone winning and we're always the ones losing. That's the kind of world into which Jesus was born. And Jesus reversed it all. Jesus changed it all. And for those willing to accept him as their leader and their forgiver, as their Lord and their Savior, he changes their life and he makes them something new from the inside out. So I'm asking today that maybe for the first time you've, you've listened to a Christian message, you've heard the Christmas story, maybe in a different way than you're accustomed to hearing it but that you understand that Christ came into this world to say, there's only one that's going to be king. It's going to be me or it's going to be you. And if you allow him to be king, if you allow him to be Lord of your life, I promise you that what he brings into your life is fulfilling, it's lasting. You'll leave a legacy, you'll leave an impact because the other way just doesn't work. And so I just want to pray for us all right now that we would return to the, the, the reality of the gospel message as we read it in Matthew, a story about a broken world into which Christ comes in order to love it and redeem it and change it from the inside out. Let's pray. Father, I just come to you today in prayer asking for you to have your way in our hearts. Herod's story is a tough story to hear. It's a story about brutality. It's a story about a, a politician drunk with power. It's a story about a politician who's all about his own ego, a politician who is literally ripping off the common people and only really ingratiating himself with the rich. God, it's a hard story to hear, but Lord, it's a story we can all relate to. We know that reality. We live that reality. We know what it's like to have to live under people who are truly wicked men and women who govern our world, who take advantage all the time of the poor and of average people. And God, into that kind of world, Jesus was born. Into that kind of world, he's bringing a lasting difference. He changes the meaning of greatness. And he says all of this stuff about winning and being on top and being the greatest, that doesn't matter as much as it is serving your neighbor and loving your neighbor and being for them what they need you to be. So God, I pray that we would take your definition of greatness to heart, that we would see that what Jesus taught is what he lived and how he lived changed the world. No great man or woman from the past ever changed the world like Jesus did. And the reason Jesus changed it is because of the values that he lived by. God, may his values, may your kingdom values be our values. May we live the reality of the kingdom of God. I pray, Lord, that you will have your way in every heart and in life. And, and if someone doesn't know you in a personal relationship, that they would just simply pray this prayer with me now. Jesus, I want you in my life. I believe I've done life my own way. That's what it means to be a sinner. I've done life my own way. And God, I want to do it your way from now on. I ask what Jesus did on the cross to be applied to my life. I ask for forgiveness for my sins. I ask God for you to do in through and for me what I can't do for myself. I turn my life over to you, lock, stock, and barrel. It's yours, Lord. Take it, use it, do with me as you will. Help me to understand this more and help me to grow as a Christian. In your name I pray, amen. Any time that you make a decision as a result of a message, as a time with another believer, whatever it may be, even if it's alone and during the week that you've just been in the Bible and God spoke to your heart and you decided to dedicate your life to Jesus Christ, we'd love to hear about that because we'd love to put resources into your hands that will help you to grow as a believer. If today's message spoke to you, if it, if it really had an impact on you, do us the greatest thing that you can do as a compliment, and that is like it and share it through your social media channels. Be with us each week in the coming weeks as we continue in this story, Christmas in a Minor Key, and we look at some of these minor characters that play a major role in the Christmas story and how they change our life and perspective forever. God bless you. Thank you. Have a great week.